So good morning, everyone. My name is Karolina Brabcova, and I'm based in the Czech Republic uh, in Prague, and I work for an NGO called Arnica. Uh, we work on plastics, uh, and uh, we work primarily on toxics and waste. I also work for a network called IPEN, International Pollutants Elimination Network, uh, which is a network of over 500 organizations working on uh, banning the persistent organic pollutants, heavy metals, and other toxics globally. So uh, let me start my presentation with a diagram of a life cycle of plastics. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, the, the fact that, that there are a lot of toxic additives which might be released throughout the entire life cycle of plastics. First of all, during the use, uh, second, uh, during the waste uh, management or waste uh, phase of the, of the life cycle, and third, also during the recycling and during the use of recycled uh, plastics. So um, uh, the, the first thing I'd like to talk about are the health uh, effects of the, uh, of the toxic additives. Um, we're currently uh, looking into toxic chemicals that have long-term health effects. Um, the traditional way of looking at toxics, which says that the dose makes the poison, is not as valid as anymore uh, in the light of uh, new scientific data. Because a lot of these chemicals have actually uh, low dose effects. So they are really dangerous for especially vulnerable populations, including children, babies, even the fetus. Uh, they're also uh, therefore very dangerous for uh, pregnant women and generally pregnant uh, and generally women of childbearing age. And the reason for this is because these chemicals actually uh, may harm the, the correct and healthy development of a child uh, during the so-called windows of vulnerability. So if even a very small dose, for example, bisphenol A, uh, during a certain specific stage of, of healthy development uh, can have actually very serious long-term health effects for the, especially for women uh, in their puberty, puberty and later on in their life. And also uh, connected with this is, is the fact that some of these chemicals actually have no safe levels. So especially in the case of heavy metals like mercury and lead, uh, some of the health scientists state that there are no safe levels of these chemicals exactly because of the fact that they can affect the healthy development, uh, especially of brain, uh, because the neurodevelopmental changes are, are key. They're often irreversible and uh, they, they, uh, they have uh, long-term very serious effects. Uh, so what kind of chemicals are we talking about? Um, Arnica has been dealing primarily with uh, persistent organic pollutants. So pollutants that basically contaminate our environment and may harm our health globally, meaning that these chemicals uh, persist in the environment, they bioaccumulate in the food chain, uh, they, uh, uh, they are contaminating our uh, uh, for example, the, the, the food, uh, the fish, uh, so especially populations which are dependent on fish consumption are highly uh, sensitive to the, to the POPs pollution. Um, I've been talking about endocrine disruptors because very often these persistent organic pollutants are also endocrine disruptors and affect the healthy uh, development of, of children's brains especially. For a lot of these chemicals, there is no glo global regulation. Uh, there are limited national regulations uh, 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 very often. Uh, but it, that's, that's very, that's kind of very small, uh, small measures uh, in light of the, of the vast pollution we're currently seeing throughout the world. Uh, the other phase I'm going to talk about is the waste, uh, waste disposal of plastics. Um, this is a picture of an incinerator in Taiwan. Um, incineration in generally is seen as an ideal solution for plastic waste or municipal waste in general uh, because you just put the waste inside and it magically disappears and we don't know about it anymore. We don't see it anymore uh, as, for example, in case of the pl global plastic pollution, which the public is so concerned about recently. 
However, that's not the entire story. Um, there are uh, there's waste incineration residues. So it's not that the, the waste disappears. About one third of the waste remains and it uh, gets stored. And as you can see here on this picture, it's very often not stored very safely. So you can see these white bags, which are basically the waste incineration residues lying there uh, next to the incinerator and which actually can uh, contaminate further the surroundings of the incinerator with highly hazardous chemicals. Uh, the waste incineration res residues consist of uh, incinerator ash, so fly ash, bottom ash, sludge, wastewater, and other 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 residues. Uh, so, as I said, about one third of of the of the waste actually uh, remains and is, is highly toxic. Uh, the the it contains hazardous chemicals, including heavy metals, for example, uh, and one of the most hazardous chemicals, uh, uh, which are dioxins. Uh, about 90% of the dioxins are actually found in the incinerator ash and Arnica has been trying to monitor dioxin uh, pollution globally for, uh, for coming out, for example, from incinerators. Um, this is a picture of an island about 70 kilometers from uh, from Oslo. Uh, this island is uh, used as a storage for waste incineration residue reduced from uh, for, for Scandinavian incinerators. It's estimated that about 500,000 tons of incineration residues has been stored there. It's very often remanufactured and used in, in, in for example, construction materials. So uh, there's not a very safe and uh, or, or uh, there is a legal gap in the way how we actually deal with waste incineration residues. It's still legally acceptable uh, that uh, incinerator ash is mixed uh, into construction materials and it's then used as a, under, as a bottom layer of roads. It's used in embankments, in construction products such as bricks. It's used as a cover layer of municipal landfills. And given the fact that the European Union uh, does not have sufficient uh, sufficient um, safety uh, safety levels for especially dioxins in in waste, we're still allowing to use uh, dioxin containing materials to be further recycled. Uh, what's happening next is that because dioxins persist in the environment and bioaccumulate in the food chain, they certainly then uh, pollute our our food. So Arnica has been collecting free-range chicken eggs from uh, from uh, outside of the outside of the incinerators throughout the world, and we've been trying to document the uh, the pollution of, of soil, the pollution of uh, of sediments, and the pollution of of food uh, from from the vicinity of the incinerator. And as you can see here on the table, we've We've depicted uh, increased levels of dioxins in these free-range chicken eggs, very often exceeding the EU safe level of dioxins in the food. Um, and once again, uh, the story goes further. Uh, it's not only the in waste incineration and uh, the landfilling of plastic waste. Uh, it's very cheap to export the waste outside of the European Union. So what happens is that separated plastic waste very often gets dumped in countries like Indonesia, Philippines, China not anymore. China actually banned the import of, of, uh, of uh, waste in 2018, but very often countries in Africa, Kenya has been the recent case. So a lot of this waste gets dumped there. And of course, the conditions under which the, the waste is handled there are much, much worse than here in Europe. Uh, people are living there on these dumps. They use it as a fuel, for example, instead of wood. Um, they they live there. They raise chicken eggs again. So again, we've been collecting free range chicken eggs from around these areas, and certainly surprise surprise, we found high levels of uh, of persistent organic pollutants in them. Uh, the second case is. Uh, 
is a waste dump, one of the largest waste dumps in the world that's located in Ghana, next to the capital city of Ghana. Uh, a lot of the electronic waste, again, separated electronic waste or used vehicles, so car waste is, is, is uh, imported here. Uh, young people are actually uh, burn the e-waste, for example, trying to retrieve precious metals and then uh, burn the plastic. And of course, uh, living on this waste dump uh, means that you're exposed to immensely increased levels of, of persistent organic pollutants. Once again, we've collected free-range chicken eggs. Once again, we found, we found really increased levels of dioxins in these eggs. Uh, one of the eggs actually exceeded the safety standard for dioxins about 220 times. Mm. So it's not only, however, it's not only the, the communities, the poor communities living around these waste dumps. Uh, these chemicals are coming back to us uh, because of the large uh, push currently toward recycling, toward reuse of the materials, which of course is a good, uh, it's, it's a good um, uh, so, uh, system. Uh, however, if recycling is contaminated with toxic additives, uh, we keep on circulating these toxics back to our homes. So we've collected, uh, we've collected products made of black plastics, which is often the plastic uh, basically reused from electronic waste. And we actually measured the levels of persistent organic pollutants in them. So uh, the products, including children toys, including kitchen supplies, including hair accessories or office supplies, these products are contaminated with legacy chemicals such as polybrominate diphenyl ethers, which have been banned about 10 years ago in the European Union. However, however they're coming back to our uh, markets in the form of recycled plastics. And it's not only these legacy chemicals, because of the really bad conditions under which the, the, this plastic is remanufactured, they are also contaminated with uh, with brominated dioxins. So I've been talking mostly about chlorinated dioxins, which are the dioxins that uh, that are found in the in the waste incineration uh, residues. But in this in these uh, re recycled plastics, we actually found brominated dioxins, and brominated dioxins are formed as byproducts of. Uh, of the of the of the remanufacturing of, of waste containing polybrominated diphenyl ethers. So by basically allowing high levels of these legacy chemicals in the waste and by allowing the the global circulation of this waste, we are actually contaminating our products, even children products, with highly toxic brominated dioxins. These brominated dioxins have been found in levels that uh, that are similar to the levels of chlorinated dioxins in, in the waste incineration residues. And they were found in children toys bought in Germany and they were found in toys bought in the Czech Republic in actually higher levels than in toys found in, in, in India or Nigeria. So what's the, uh, what's the future going to bring us? Um, it's actually going to get from bad to worse because the plastic and chemical production is set to grow rapidly. Given the fact that the oil is actually being used less and less as a fuel, there is a huge increase in, in plastics and chemicals production. So we're wit witnessing a, a, a new chemical plants, uh, new production of plastics in countries in the Middle East, in China, in Southeast Asia, but also in the United States, for example. And the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, estimates that there is going to be 500% increase of plastics production from 2010 to 2050. So in 30 years, there's going to be at least three to four times more plastics out there. And there is no way that we're going to be able to deal with the plastic, weight, with the plastic waste in an environmentally friendly or environmentally sound way. So, you know, polluted beaches, this is not something which is going to go away if the plastic and the chemical production is going to, going to be rising. So... Are bioplastic safe alternatives? Is it a way to go for 
for bioplastics. Yes, to some extent, certainly. However, there should be two things taken into account. One, uh, the biodegradability. So we really need to make sure that they do biodegrade not only under laboratory conditions, but also in the environment. There's not, for example, microplastics coming out of the bioplastics uh, dumped, for example, in the environment as compostables. Uh, and also, second, very really important, toxic additives in bioplastics. Uh, we need to make sure that if bioplastics are being designed, that they are designed in a way that does not include toxic additives. And we have already seen scientific studies showing that, for example, products made of starch or cellulose, they actually induce really strong in vitro toxicity. So they actually do contain high levels of toxic additives. The other question is, do we actually substitute you know, all the single-use packaging currently made of uh, fossil fuel with, uh, with bio-based bio plastics? Because if the production uh, is going to grow uh, exponentially, there is going to be a huge amount of waste coming out from bioplastics or natural materials, even paper or, or, or molded fiber containers. Uh, you know, economies, especially economies in the South, they don't have, you know, waste management schemes that are being able to handle more and more single-use packaging or waste made of, made of bioplastics. So we need to actually introduce tax mechanisms that will be dealing with non-recyclable, single-use, non-repairable products and materials. And they will favor actually repairable uh, products and materials that are made of toxics free uh, yeah toxics free uh, sub uh, substances what we actually are also witnessing that there are a lot of industry initiatives that show us a way forward there are industry initiatives that are uh, that are willingly substituting substances of very high concern or even substances in the sin list, which is actually a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a larger, larger group of chemicals that have the same properties. So there are carcinogens, mutagens, or protoxic uh, substances or endocrine disruptors or, or persistent organic pollutants. So there, there are uh, industries that are avoiding voluntarily these chemicals in their product uh, chain. Uh, there are initiatives that are tracking uh, chemicals throughout their entire production. So, the, for example, the Chemical Footprint Project, there is a proactive al alliance of industries that are trying to introduce full traceability of chemicals within the supply chain because it's the downstream users, it's the consumers and the downstream users who just basically don't know what kind of toxic chemicals are in their product. It's very hard to track that. And if we do not know, then we we cannot deal with it. And there are also alliances of, of industries that are calling for strict group substitution and group restrictions for really highly hazardous chemicals, including, for example, perfluorinated chemicals. Um, but that's not enough. Uh, I think what we need to see are really strong legal measures because even if we're going to have in, here in Europe very progressive industry, there needs to be global restrictions, especially on the, the high, highly, uh, highly hazardous chemicals such as the persistent organic pollutants or heavy metals or endocrine disruptors. We need to actually extend uh, the responsibility to the producer. So extended producer's responsibility needs to happen, especially for companies that are producing chemicals because they are the ones who are responsible for the external costs. Once these materials are out there, are being used, uh, are be becoming waste, we need to make sure that uh, you know, these companies pay for the, the pollution. Um, so there, are, there needs to be policy actions to manage toxics. And as I mentioned, there are toxic, uh, tax initiatives that can be implemented there. So thank you very much. Um, there are also resources on our website at arnica.org or ipen.org. And on the last line, you can see a link to some of our studies. So thank you very much. And I invite you to, for, to some questions. Thank you.